I'm Dave Wagner. I'm one of the people you're going to be stuck with over the next two and a half days. Um, and I wanted to start out by welcoming you all here and giving you an overview of what we're going to do and giving us a chance to meet each other. Um, so, um, who am I? Maybe I should start there. Um, I'm uh, from the Berkeley uh, Computer Science Department. I'm one of the crew who teaches our introductory Foundations of Data Science course. I'm really excited about it. I think it's awesome. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm here. I wanted to do this workshop was I'm excited to show you some of what we've been doing and have a conversation with you all about how to teach data science. OK, yeah, so what is this course? Um, this uh, sounds like a bunch of you have looked at this already, so maybe uh, I'm going to be. Hope I'm not going to be repeating too much for you. But for the rest of you, this is our entry-level data science course. This is the first course on data science that we developed, I would say, for a large audience. Um, it's um, aimed at um, it's freshman and sophomore, um, and the goal was to develop a course that had no prerequisites. That's open to everyone straight out of high school. No requirements for calculus, um, no requirements for any programming knowledge, no particular math background beyond whatever they're likely to see in high school. Um, we're hoping to make it accessible so that it's accessible not just to technical students, but we really want to bring in um, a broad group of students and have the entire course feel like something they can succeed in. And, um, and in the surveys we've been hearing, I think that's been pretty successful. We have a pretty diverse group of students taking the course with a lot of interesting perspectives. So that's some of the design principles. Um, what we're trying to do here is teach um, data science um, involving both uh, computational thinking elements and uh, inferential. So you could think of this, that's, there's some computer science, you could call it, in some statistics. Um, and the course, um, we have a core course. And then um, there's a set of connectors. So the, each connector is um, a, a smaller course that's aimed at a particular application of data science. Um, let's see, examples jump to mind. Um, there's a business school one, there's a statistics one, there's a yeah. uh, cognitive neuroscience one. Demography, Demography. yeah, geospatial analysis. Yeah. So um, each discipline that's doing data science, we have a whole bunch of instructors who are teaching a connector. And what the, ideally, what happens is the students take the core course and they take a connector at the same time. And the connector is using the core concepts in the context of that particular application. Um, students are not don't have to take a connector. They can just take the core course, and um, you know we get some of both models, but. Um, this is a way to bring in connections to other application domains and let students sort of tailor their experience towards their interests. And the real goal here, I think, maybe would be to say, um, I would love to see data science as the new Latin, right? <laughs> like, what was it, you know, 50 or 100 years ago to be an educated person, you had to know Latin, right? I think that there's some kind of numeracy and ability to work with data that's an incredibly useful uh, skill and ability to have that's useful in a huge swath of disciplines across the campus. And so hopefully we're creating some opportunities for students to pick that up. Um, so how did our course emerge? <laughs> it's emerged from the bottom up. And there's some background context here that led to the creation of data. One, one of those was um, we started to see students voting with their feet even before we had a data science course to try to get some elements of what we might think of now as data science. For instance, in the computer science department, we had our, traditionally in the computer science department, for first order approximation, we teach our majors. We haven't really done anything to serve non-majors. Um, and yet it turned out that uh, as of a couple of years ago, students started taking our introductory course, our first course in the sequence for majors, in, in you know, huge numbers to the point where like a third to a half of that course was 
students who were non-majors and probably weren't going to be majors. Um, and didn't satisfy fulfill a requirement they wanted to get, I guess, some programming experience. Which was, you know, kind of made us go home a little bit because that course wasn't really designed and isn't probably the thing we would teach to someone if they were going to take one course in computer science. It was a beginning of a sequence. In statistics, we saw this huge growth in students jumping to take statistics courses. And at the same time, I think we started to have this feeling like here's this here's this direction that would be really useful for students to know. And we started to talk to people um, uh, across the campus in a variety of disciplines saying, I'd really like if students, when they came in and took my course, already came in with the ability and some knowledge about how to do data analysis. So that I don't have to teach that before I can you know, start teaching my subject. The students just know. So I guess there emerged a group of, of people, both from computer science and stats, and also from a bunch of other disciplines, looking at how we can serve the student need and how we can maybe lead a little bit and what we think would be useful for students to know. Because the students were sort of trying to self-assemble this without maybe knowing quite how to do it. Um, yeah, so that was the opportunity. Catherine, is there more about the history that I um, and the course got created, uh, I think maybe the other interesting thing about how this course got created was as a just do it kind of exercise, where there were a couple of, you know, we had some committees and lots of discussions, but what it really came down to was um, basically two of our like amazing teachers got together and said, let's create this course. Um, so it was not, the pathway was not, let's figure out how to make it required or let's create a major, it was just, we're going to create a course and throw it out there and see see if any fish bite on the um, So if you're thinking about a model of how do you get started from zero, I actually think that's a really appealing model. Because what we did find was that, wow, there's enormous excitement and interest in wanting to take the course. And it didn't matter that our first iterations didn't satisfy any requirements. You know, they weren't, they weren't an entry. It wasn't entry into any major. It wasn't you know, sort of satisfying breadth requirements, basically. It was just something students wanted to know. So I think that's a very workable model. Um, yeah, I mentioned that we wanted to try to make the course accessible. So let me talk a little bit about the philosophy about trying to do that. I read, I remember reading um, a book by Stephen Hawking, Angel of Physics, that started out wanting to be a physics thinker. He has this fantastic book, A Brief History of Time, where he talks about some of his research and some of the big ideas in, in uh, physics. And one of the things he mentions is publisher told him, uh, are you planning to do any equations? I hope you don't put any equations in your book. Every equation you put in your book has your audience. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of the model that I have in mind for this course. I think it's very easy. You know, there's some students who come in, they have a facility with math, they have a comfort with math, but I think there's many, many more. There's a much broader audience for whom uh, maybe feel a little bit intimidated by math, get overloaded by formulas. Uh, if you're doing equations upon equations and mathematical derivations, it's hard to connect that. Um, and can feel like they're out of place. It's, I think it's easy to come out of high school feeling maybe a little bit sort of terrified by math. It's like, you know, it's something that I struggle with and I don't feel good at. And so um, when we looked at how statistics has traditionally been taught, right, that's how we teach it. There's a lot of math. Some derivations or some calculus, you know, we're doing integrals with probability density functions. Um, and uh, part of the philosophy here of data e is we're trying to really minimize that. So I wouldn't say it's zero, but um, the opportunity we saw was with computing, there's now an opportunity to teach the statistical side in a different way. Where um, 100 years ago, if you wanted to do statistical inference, prediction, We didn't, we didn't have computers, and your ability to do pencil and paper calculation was pretty limited, and so we really needed to find ways to analytically do an analytical derivation that would let us find a formula that finds a very clean way to calculate the confidence interval or the t value or whatever. Um, and so that leads you down a very mathematical path, and that leads how the, I learned statistics. Um, and what we saw was an opportunity to um, use uh, 
computers and simulation to teach a lot of these concepts in a way that lets us sort of bypass all of that. And so hopefully when I show you tomorrow morning how we're teaching hypothesis testing, you'll see a little bit more of that. Uh, the cost, of course, is that we have to teach students some programming. So that's the downside, that's the trade-off. Instead of teaching them the math, now we've got to learn this other foreign thing, which is the computer programming. So not ideal, but on the plus side, there's kind of a plus side of that, which is I think for many of the students, that's actually a bonus. It's something they would, a useful skill they'd like to know is they'd like to be able to do some programming. Even if they never take another program or a course in college, they have no plan to be a software engineer, to have some ability to do that, I think, is like a, you know, something they think of as an asset for their career and useful for them to know. So hopefully that's a good trade-off. Um, another way we try to do it is with a bunch of case studies can connect to so we don't spend the entire semester uh, flipping coins rolling dice uh, yeah so maybe we'll see ways that this comes up as we talk about it um, some of the ideas that I'm excited about in this course to give you like a preview of what you'll see um, one idea in this course is um, we teach some programming, and um, when we talk about how to work with data, the core concept here that's throughout the course is uh, tables. You know, R, I think it's a data frame. Um, so this is how we organize uh, the data. And from a programming perspective, um, this is how students program. So we're not trying to have them do a lot of hardcore, low-level programming. Instead, we teach them a little bit of Python, we give them a programming environment we constructed, a library we constructed that has a, a simple way to work with uh, data tables and a bunch of operations you can do on them. And then a lot of the programming students do is by putting together these pieces, a sequence of operations. You know, I'm going to do a select and a where clause, and I'm going to join these two tables. Some of the, some of the, some they have to do some programming, but a lot of it can be done through table operations. So um, this provides a way to make accessible and I think it's very relevant um, you know the operations we're giving students this basically comes out of SQL or pandas um, you'll find the same kind of same kind of operations there we're basically giving them a think of it as like a cleaned up version of pandas if you like it's maybe a little more accessible or it doesn't have So that's one piece. Um, so you could think of this as um, if, if your starting point for data science is Excel, this is the next level. <laughs> um, hypothesis testing, one of the things that we do pretty different from how I learned statistics is we teach hypothesis testing using simulation, as I mentioned. So using the computer as an enabler. Um, so instead of teaching t-tests and things like that, um, we're teaching uh, non-parametric methods, um, using simulation, the bootstrap, the permutation tests. Um, and more and more and one of the things that's nice about that is I feel like it lets me talk more about the concepts, like the meaning of it. I can talk about what we're doing with hypothesis testing and how to interpret a p-value and where it comes from, and less about like getting bogged down Math. And the other benefit is I think it's useful maybe in the long run um, that they're able to do, they get more powerful methods. So they can, uh, you know, they know how to do, they don't, uh, if they learn a t-test, then they learn how to do a hypothesis test when their data is normally distributed. Some assumptions. Um, but the techniques for teaching them are non-parametric, so they can be used in general, pretty general cases, and they're not limited to just I want to test whether the mean is, uh, you know, larger than zero or something like that, but allow them to do hypothesis tests with uh, arbitrary statistics. So hopefully they learn something pretty powerful and pretty advanced in this way and don't even realize that it was advanced material they're learning uh, because it's, you know, it's a little bit mind-bending, but it's, it's achievable, it's understandable. Uh, um, another interesting innovation here that some of you have mentioned has been uh, the technology here. And this is kind 
kind of stealings from some other large courses here at Berkeley is we've started to build up some infrastructure for how do you teach at a large scale. Um, some of that is uh, auto grading to give students rapid feedback. Uh, some of that is the like the Jupyter notebook um, cloud-based uh, programming models to so that students can um, open a web browser, give them all the programming software, we don't have to do IT tech support for them when I want to install software. Um, but we got a bunch of other pieces there that we've sort of built up over time. And I'm happy to tell you about and like steal and point this game. So those are some of the ideas to look for over the next few days. Um, So, how do students learn um, programming? We spend maybe the first third of the course teaching them programming and some data visualization and working with data. Um, and partly they're going to learn some of the concepts through lecture, but a lot of it you learn through practice. And so there's practicing in a lab. So we have uh, three hours of lecture and two hours of lab each week. And that's done using uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And in lecture, we teach with a combination of slides for the concepts. And then we open a notebook, similar to what they'll be working in, and um, can do live demonstrations. So um, I'm going to show you some of the material we teach. But it's probably not the best way to experience it, actually. Probably the best way to experience it is to go look at it directly yourself on your own. Um, you can find the materials on our course webpage. It's data8.org. Um, and we have a bunch of stuff there. So you can find um, information about the courses each semester. Um, you can find all the assignments are available there. So you can, you can find the, like the, the homeworks and the labs, um, the slides. Um, there's videos for recent semesters are sadly, for reasons outside of our control, limited to only Berkeley people. But if you go back, to an early enough semester. I forget, it's like, I don't know, spring 2017 or something before. You can see the videos of lectures as well. So if you'd like to see how we teach it in lecture. Um, so you're welcome to use any of that material. Um, we can also share materials with you. We can share assignments with you. So that's one resource where you can find more. Um, and our course textbook is online and free, um, which students like. Um, so you can use that as well. It's inferentialthinking.com. Glad to have you using as many of these resources as you'd like. Okay. So what do we tell students about what is data science? We kind of we try to hit three themes. One theme is uh, understanding the data, exploration, data exploration, data visualization. So that's about the first third of the course, just talking about that, as well as teaching them how to do the programming they need to do the rest. Um, the next piece we try to teach them about is inference, um, drawing inferences from the data. So that's finding patterns and then uh, checking whether those patterns are something you can trust, statistical significance, hypothesis testing. Um, and then the final third of the course is uh, prediction. So uh, linear regression, making predictions. So that's kind of the three major pieces we teach them. And the programming part comes in this first third, both because we need them to know programming for the rest, and also because you know, that as they're doing programming, they're, they're doing something with the code. They're, you know, they're getting some ability, and the ability is to do the exploratory analysis. Of the data. Start to do some visualization, start to look at the data. Um, so the way we start the course, I thought what I'd do is maybe spend the next, I don't know, half hour, 45 minutes talking to you about that first third of the course. And this is a part that's probably the most traditional, so uh, maybe spend the least amount of time on it compared to the other topics. Um, but we start with talking about uh, causality, um, the standard material about 
associations versus uh, causation, and uh, when can you infer causation? And we we start with this um, the classic example of Johnson. Yeah. I'm curious, actually, uh, how much of this course would you say was informed by statisticians versus computer scientists versus mathematicians, and what the experience, how how it's been received amongst folk and others outside of those groups, but uh, how it's been received in each of those groups, um, and do you think if it was like predominantly a diff you know a different group of people at a different university, would it should it would it be designed? To yeah, I mean, how the people, so it was probably influenced by the people, and the core group was sort of some stats, some CS, and some rest of, uh, some disciplines they're using in the science. And the two I mentioned who actually created the course and did all the light work, that was a computer scientist and a statistician. So you see lots of, some, some computing maybe, and, and lots of statistics, inspired by a lot of statistics, but uh, Maybe it is a different view on statistics. And then some applications. Um, would be different. Let's talk about someone. I'm sure. I'm not sure how exactly. Well, for instance, uh, your first line there is not something I would place in that book. I would say correlation versus causation. You're saying association versus causation. And that is, I think, a computer science way of thinking about it as opposed to a statistical. came from the statistics <laughs> person on the team, okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. Not to break up the order, but yeah. I think the part of the but at some point, would you be talking about the legwork that you mentioned in the during the bar and from the different types of people on campus? Or if you can mention a few things. Uh-huh, yeah, Catherine. Uh, Spent a lot of time on that. Yeah, and I haven't spent nearly as much time as Catherine has, but of the some of the meetings, what some of the things that I remember hearing from some of the courses that were going to build on this, what they wanted um, regression. Many of them mentioned would like students to feel comfortable knowing what regression is, being able to do it. Um, hypothesis testing was another common one of p-values, some understanding of what that means. Um, another common one that I heard was Excel. 
you know, we do excel. Can, we, can you please, you know, help students? I, you know, I heard language like, can you please help students know how to work with data in Excel? And I think what they really meant so was, you know, help enable students to be able to do this kind of data inspection and exploration and visualization. What's starting to happen is that um, a number of the other majors are starting to replace their statistics um, prereq and say you can either take a stats course or you can take this course, which I think is great because I think for their needs actually, you know, this may meet their needs as well as a standard intro to stats course. Um, not, not marketing it as a replacement for statistics exactly, but. So the point you just brought up, we had a discussion about this here, and I, I wonder to the extent, what extent do you see this course and what you do as being an agent of change versus addressing uh, or, or sort of um, educating to the demands? So it seems like you've dismissed Excel because you want to, you think that there's something better, but you haven't dismissed, I don't know, PDAIs necessarily, although you're doing <laughs> permutation tests. So I, I mean, I'm just wondering, how do you balance that? Because there's clearly some value judgment that some things need to move in a new direction, and some things we have to provide the tools that other domains uh, think are standard. Yeah, uh, I don't have a I don't have a like a single answer for you, but I, there definitely is some of that going on where there's some areas where we think, um, yeah, agent of change. We believe in this is a better way to teach it, and that. We're, you know, that takes some doing because the professors of those other courses learn the stats in a different way. So now you have to have a conversation where it's not enough, you know, kind of being able to teach the students this new way is only the first step. And then the second step is teaching the faculty. <laughs> um, but there's definitely some areas where um, we're following very much a standard path. So the regression, for instance. And I think that's important. I think that's such useful, you know, knowing how to do some linear regression. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. I think that people will use this in different ways. I think that some people will use it as a replacement for intro statistics or coursework that is not super centered upon statistics, but which requires statistics knowledge. I would use it as a carry. These are interesting things that you can learn how to do much more rigorously. And uh, I would use it instead as something to get more people interested. And rather than being an end unto itself, I think it's a very useful way of getting people interested in the deeper nuances of their sense. satisfies a distribution requirement, you get 90% people who don't care and 10% people who really care. And we took the, the rather bizarre tack of actually removing the distribution requirement for this course because people said, well, you're, you're crazy. That, this is math distribution. No, we don't want the math distribution students. We want the students interested in data. And we found that we had to do Okay, 
So this is this is where we start the, co the course <laughs> is with um, this discussion of things, you know, these topics like randomized controlled experiments and what can you infer from, from data, observational data, controlled data. We talk about John, classic example of John Snow and the water water pump handle and how you know track down. Um, and, you know, there's a kind of a second piece of that story which is interesting, which is uh, ties in very nicely to the studies, which is she looked at different water companies. I don't know how many of you know about this piece of the story, but uh, there were multiple water companies that were supplying water at the height of the cholera epidemic. And, um, and uh, you know, he gathered some data about the rate of the cholera infection among the different customers and found that um, the rate was much higher for one of the water companies. And so then you can start to use that to talk about how what, you know, what inferences can we draw um, from the data. So I think it's a nice accessible example to start with and it sort of illustrates trying to put a lot of examples and real data into the lectures so that when we teach a concept it's let's start with here's this need, here's this data set, here's this question that we'd like to answer now what concepts are going to help us do that. Okay, so then we dive into teaching programming and teaching data exploration and visualization. Um, pretty much every lecture has some data set that we're looking at. Um, maybe one data set lasts us through a bunch of lectures. So where do we start? So how many of you have like taught programming before? Okay, how many of you are interested in how to teach programming? Okay, so I don't really know because I don't have a lot of experience teaching at this introductory level, but I can tell you what we do. And I don't know if we do, I don't know. I don't feel very knowledgeable about this subject. Um, so we start by teaching them a little bit of Python. So we teach them names, how to have a given name something, that's a variable basically. Um, and we teach them about how to, how to call a function, how to invoke a function. That's so they can use these operations on tables. And then we start, we use that to look at some data. So we're looking at movies, uh, gross revenues, profits. Start by like asking, hey, what do you think was the most highest grossing movie of all time? Start to answer some, look at some questions about that data. And we use this to um, introduce the idea of data being organized in tables and um, starting to show them some basic operations on, on tables. And all these will be familiar if you know some. So select and where and join and sort and group by. Those, that's, the, that's the set of operations we're building up. So then the next thing we start to teach them is some, some basic expressions. So how do, you, how, do you, how do you do arithmetic numbers, arrays? So there's the vectorization. Um, ranges, strings, lists, so the basic data types and how to do some simple operations on them. Um, because that will probably be in the tables, for instance. Um, and so somewhere around here, we give them some discussion question like this. So this is an example um, question that we'll do in a lecture is we'll ask them, okay, we've introduced to you some operations. Now you have this table, what code would you do Give me just this one column. And the answer is you use a select operation. And then we give them another one and say, okay, you have this table, and how would you find the largest and highest score? So you can think how you might do that last one. Some of the operations I mentioned. Okay, so what's relevant about this is. Um, one of the things we're trying to do throughout the lectures is peer instruction. So, um, I bet that everyone here is familiar with this, but if you're not, I, I think it works really well. It's a really nice way to break up your lectures is you pick a question to sort of test their understanding and force them apply what they've been learning. Something fairly simple and hopefully fairly easy if they've been following. You give the question, you ask them, think about how you would solve this. And then you ask them, talk to the person next to you about how to approach this. See what you can find. Uh, let them discuss for a minute. And then 
go back to the class and you know, ask them, what did you come up with? And use that to assess how they're understanding what kinds of answers people are giving. Um, see if there are multiple answers and have them discuss how would I know which one is right. And you know, one of multiple things can happen at that point. Sometimes you discover everybody has got it. And so you just move on. And sometimes you discover, oh, there were two different answers and you know, people are a little confused and how do I choose you two? And then you can have a little bit of an on the fly discussion. Well, you know, what are your thoughts about this one? What are your thoughts about that one? How would I choose between them? Why might someone choose this? Why might someone choose Um, so this takes a little bit of doing to figure out what is the right questions that help you probe student understanding and one of the ways that I found helpful for that is uh, keeping track from the previous semester what was a common student misconception or confusion and then actually ask a, ask a little bit each other that. Also do multiple choice, so ABC, and they can raise hand. So then we've taught them teeny bit of programming. We start to now use that to teach them some data visualizations. So we teach some basic visualizations. Bar charts, scatter charts, line graphs, histograms. Histograms takes a little bit of talking about. Um, not entirely trivial. And we teach them about how to choose a visualization based on understanding what's categorical versus numerical data and use that to give them some guidelines for how to create some visualizations. And then we start to work with a data set. So we look at the US, some US census data, and we do some more exploratory analysis of the movie gross revenues. And we tell them this is the first step you do with any data set, is you look at the data. Start to visualize the data, you know, graph and chart different aspects of it, so you get a feeling for what's there. Um, so then we teach them about um, how to define their own functions and how to do ply operation. That's the map operation if you're a list person how to do group and join, and then we do use that to build up some more, some more complicated analysis. Finally, we teach them control statements. So we teach them how to uh, do comparisons, and we teach them if and for statements so they can do loops and iteration. And we teach them how to do random selection. Give them an operation they can do to randomly select from a set, and that's gonna be useful for the simulation. Um, we're teaching them this stuff so that they can do simulations. So in a simulation, we're going to want to say, like, simulate this process a thousand times. So they're going to need a for loop for that. So each one of the things we teach them is because later we desperately need it. They have to know it. We can't leave it out. Everything else we've left out. And that's it. That's what we teach them.